friends, I'm Ellie. Welcome to Cardboard Design. Today, let's listen to interesting and meaningful fairy tales. I believe you will like it. The first fairy tale, The Little Folks Presents. A tailor and a goldsmith were traveling together. And one evening when the sun had sunk behind the mountains, they heard the sound of distant music, which became more and more distinct. It sounded strange, but so pleasant that they forgot all their weariness and stepped quickly onward. The moon had already arisen when they reached a hill on which they saw a crowd of little men and women, who had taken each other's hands and were whirling round in the dance with the greatest pleasure and delight. They sang to it most charmingly, and that was the music which the travelers had heard. In the midst of them sat an old man who was rather taller than the rest. He wore a party-colored coat and his iron gray beard hung down over his breast. The two remained standing full of astonishment and watched the dance. The old man made a sign that they should enter and the little folks willingly opened their circle. The goldsmith, who had a hump and like all hunchbacks was brave enough, stepped in. The tailor felt a little afraid at first and held back, but when he saw how merrily all was going, he plucked up his courage and followed. The circle closed again directly and the little mm, folks yummy. went on singing and dancing with the wildest leaps. The old man, however, took a large knife which hung to his girdle, whetted it, and when it was sufficiently sharpened, he looked round at the strangers. They were terrified, but they had not much time for reflection, for the old man seized the goldsmith and with the greatest speed, shaved the hair of his head clean off, and then the same thing happened to the tailor, but their fear left them when, after he had finished his work, the old man clapped them both on the shoulder in a friendly manner, as much as to say, they had behaved well to let all that be done to them willingly and without any struggle. He pointed with his finger to a heap of coals which lay at one side, and signified to the travelers by his gestures that they were to fill their pockets with them. Both of them obeyed, although they did not know of what use the coals would be to them, and then they went on their way to seek a shelter for the night. When they had got into the valley, the clock of the neighboring monastery struck twelve, and the song ceased. In a moment all had vanished, and the hill lay in solitude in the moonlight. The two travelers found an inn, and covered themselves up on their straw beds with their coats, but in their weariness forgot to take the coals out of them before doing so. A heavy weight on their limbs awakened them earlier than usual. They felt in the pockets, and could not believe their eyes when they saw that they were not filled with coals but with pure gold. Happily, too, the hair of their heads and beards was there again as thick as ever. They had now become rich folks, but the goldsmith, who, in accordance with his greedy disposition, had filled his pockets better, was as rich again as the tailor. A greedy man, even if he has much, still wishes to have more, so the goldsmith proposed to the tailor that they should wait another day and go out again in the evening in order to bring back still greater treasures from the old man on the hill. The tailor refused, and said, I have enough and am content. Now I shall be a master, and marry my dear object. For so he called his sweetheart, and I am a happy man. But he stayed another day to please him. In the evening the goldsmith hung a couple of bags over his shoulders that he might be able to stow away a great deal, and took the road to the hill. He found, as on the night before, the little folks at their singing and dancing, and the old man again shaved him clean and signed to him to take some coal away with him. He was not slow about sticking as much into his bag as would go, went back quite delighted, and covered himself over with his coat. Even if the gold does weigh heavily, said he, I will gladly bear that. And at last he fell asleep with the sweet anticipation of waking in the morning an enormously rich man. When he opened his eyes, he got up in haste to examine his pockets, but how amazed he was when he drew nothing out of them but black coal, and that howsoever often he put his hands in them. The gold I got the night before is still there for me, thought he, and went and brought it out, but how shocked he was when he saw that it likewise had again turned into coal. He smote his forehead with his dusty black hand, and then he felt that his whole head was bald and smooth as was also the place where his beard should have been. But his misfortunes were not yet over. He now remarked for the first time that in addition to the hump on his back, a second, just as large, had grown in front on his breast. Then he recognized the punishment of his greediness and began to weep aloud. The good tailor, 
who was wakened by this comforted the unhappy fellow as well as he could, and said, Thou hast been my comrade in my traveling time, thou shalt stay with me and share in my wealth. He kept his word, but the poor goldsmith was obliged to carry the two humps as long as he lived and to cover his bald head with a cap. The goldsmith's insatiable desire for more wealth results in the loss of his initial fortune. The transformation of gold into coal and the physical changes in his appearance symbolize the consequences of unchecked greed. Despite the goldsmith's greed, the tailor remains loyal and offers comfort in the face of misfortune. This highlights the importance of friendship and supporting others, even in challenging circumstances. The goldsmith's physical transformation, bald head, smooth face, and additional hump serve as a punishment for his greed. This reflects the idea that wrongdoing and excessive desire can lead to negative consequences. The story implies that inner beauty and contentment are more valuable than material wealth. The physical transformations of the goldsmith highlight the superficial nature of materialistic pursuit. The Second Fairy Tale The Willow Wren In former days, every sound still had its meaning and application. When the smith's hammer resounded, it cried, Strike away! Strike away! When the carpenter's plane grated, it said, Here goes! Here goes! If the mill wheel began to clack, it said, Help! Lord God! Help! Lord God! And if the miller was a chief and happened to leave the mill, it spoke high German and first asked slowly, Who is there? Who is there? And then answered quickly, The miller! The miller! And at last quite in a hurry, He steals bravely! He steals bravely! Three pecks in a bushel! At this time the birds also had their own language which everyone understood. Now it only sounds like chirping, screeching, and whistling, and to some like music without words. It came into the birds' mind, however, that they would no longer be without a ruler and would choose one of themselves to be their king. When alone amongst them, the green clever was opposed to this. He had lived free and would die free, and anxiously flying hither and thither, he cried, Where shall I go? Where shall I go? He retired into a solitary and unfrequented marsh and showed himself no more among his fellows. The birds now wished to discuss the matter, and on a fine May morning they all gathered together from the woods and fields. Eagles and chaffinches, owls and crows, larks and sparrows, how can I name them all? Even the cuckoo came, and the hoopoo, his clerk, who is so called because he is always heard a few days before him, and a very small bird which as yet had no name, mingled with the band. The hen, which by some accident had heard nothing of the whole matter, was astonished at the great assemblage. What, what, what is going to be done? She cackled, but the cock calmed his beloved hen and said, Only rich people, and told her what they had on hand. It was decided, however, that the one who could fly the highest should be king. A tree frog which was sitting among the bushes, when he heard that, cried a warning. No, 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 no! Because he thought that many tears would be shed because of this, but the crow said, Ka, ka! And that all would pass off peaceably. It was now determined that on this fine morning they should at once begin to ascend, so that hereafter no one should be able to say, I could easily have flown much higher, but the evening came on, and I could do no more. On a given signal, therefore, the whole troop rose up in the air. The dust ascended from the land, and there was tremendous fluttering and whirring and beating of wings, and it looked as if a black cloud was rising up. The little birds were, however, soon left behind. They could go no farther, and fell back to the ground. The larger birds held out longer, but none could equal the eagle who mounted so high that he could have picked the eyes out of the sun. And when he saw that the others could not get up to him, he thought, Why shouldest thou fly still higher? Thou art the king! And began to let himself down again. The birds beneath him at once cried to him, Thou must be our king. No one has flown so high as thou. Except me! Screamed the little fellow without a name who had crept into the breast feathers of the eagle. And as he was not at all tired, he rose up and mounted so high that he reached heaven itself. When, however, he had gone as far as this, he folded his wings together and called down with clear and penetrating voice, I am king! I am king! Thou, 
our king! cried the birds angrily. Thou hast compassed it by trick and cunning! So they made another condition. He should be king who could go down lowest in the ground. How the goose did flap about with its broad breast when it was once more on the land. How quickly the cock scratched a hole. The duck came off the worst of all, for she leapt into a ditch but sprained her legs and waddled away to a neighboring pond, crying, Cheatin, cheatin. The little bird without a name, however, sought out a mouse, whole slipped down into it, and cried out of it with his small voice, I am king! I am king! Thou art king! cried the bird still more angrily. Dost thou think thy cunning shall prevail? They determined to keep him a prisoner in the hole and starve him out. The owl was placed as sentinel in front of it, and was not to let the rascal out if she had any value for her life. When evening was come all the birds were feeling very tired after exerting their wings so much, so they went to bed with their wives and children. The owl alone remained standing by the mouse hole gazing steadfastly into it with her great eyes. In the meantime she, too, had grown tired and thought to herself, You might certainly shut one eye, you will still watch with the other, and the little miscreant shall not come out of his hole. So she shut one eye, and with the other looked straight at the mouse hole. The little fellow put his head out and peeked, hmm. and wanted to slip away, but the owl came forward immediately, and he drew his head back again. Then the owl opened the one eye again, and shut the other, Ooh, intending to shut them in turn all through the night. But when she next shut the one eye, she forgot to open the other, and as soon as both her eyes were shut, she fell asleep. The little fellow soon observed that, and slipped away. From that day forth, the owl has never dared to show herself by daylight, for if she does the other birds chase her and pluck her feathers out. She only flies out by night, but hates and pursues mice because they make such ugly holes. The little bird, too, is very unwilling to let himself be seen because he is afraid it will cost him his life if he is caught. He steals about in the hedges, and when he is quite safe, he sometimes cries, I am king! And for this reason, the other birds call him in mockery, king of the hedges. No one, however, was so happy as the lark at not having to obey the little king. As soon as the sun appears, she ascends high in the air and cries, Ah, uh, how beautiful that is! Beautiful that is! Beautiful, beautiful! Ah, uh, how beautiful that is! The dispute among the birds about choosing their king illustrates the significance of power and greed. Many bird species desire to seize power, but greed and cunning ultimately lead to negative consequences. Larger birds especially eagles, often display pride and boast about their ability to fly high. However, excessive pride and inconsistency can lead to undesirable outcomes. This small, nameless bird symbolizes wisdom and cunning. Despite being small, it possesses creativity and finds intelligent solutions to claim power for itself. The intelligence of the small bird in avoiding starvation and capitalizing on a vulnerability to escape the mouse hole emphasizes the consequences of cleverness in the face of challenges. In summary, this story imparts lessons about pride, greed, and the value of wisdom and humility in life. It also underscores the consequences of careless actions and the importance of making wise and clever choices in the face of challenges. The third fairy tale, The Turn Up. There were once two brothers who both served as soldiers. One of them was rich and the other poor. Then the poor one, to escape from his poverty, put off his soldier's coat and turned farmer. He dug and hoed his bit of land and sowed it with turnip seed. The seed came up and one turnip grew there which became large and vigorous and visibly grew bigger and bigger and seemed as if it would never stop growing so that it might have been called the princess of turnips. For never was such an one seen before, and never will such an one be seen again. At length it was so enormous that by itself it filled a whole cart, and two oxen were required to draw it. And the farmer had not the least idea what he was to do with the turnip, or whether it would be a fortune to him or a misfortune. At last he thought, If thou celest it, what wilt thou get for it that is of any importance, and if thou eatest it thyself? Why, the small turnips would do the just as much good. It would be better to take it to the king, and make him a present of it. 
So he placed it on a cart, harnessed two oxen, took it to the palace, and presented it to the king. What strange thing is this? Said the king. Many wonderful things have come before my eyes, but never such a monster as this. From what seed can this have sprung, or are you a love child and have met with it by chance? Ah, uh, no! Said the farmer. No luck child am I. I am a poor soldier, who because he could no longer support himself hung his soldier's coat on a nail and took to farming land. I have a brother who is rich and well known to you, Lord King. But I, because I have nothing, am forgotten by everyone. Then the king felt compassion for him, and said, Thou shalt be raised from thy poverty, and shalt have such gifts from me that thou shalt be equal to thy rich brother. Then he bestowed on him much gold, and lands, and meadows, and herds, and made him immensely rich, so that the wealth of the other brother could not be compared with his. When the rich brother heard what the poor one had gained for himself with one single turnip, he envied him, and thought in every way how he also could get hold of a similar piece of luck. He would, however, set about it in a much wiser way, and took gold and horses and carried them to the king, and made certain the king would give him a much larger present in return. If his brother had got so much for one turn up, what would he not carry away with him in return for such beautiful things as these? The king accepted his present, and said he had nothing to give him in return that was more rare and excellent than the great turnip. So the rich man was obliged to put his brother's turnip in a cart and have it taken to his home. When there he did not know on whom to vent his rage and anger until bad thoughts came to him, and he resolved to kill his brother. He hired murderers who were to lie in ambush, and then he went to his brother and said, Dear brother, I know of a hidden treasure. We will dig it up together and divide it between us. The other agreed to this and accompanied him without suspicion. While they were on their way, however, the murderers fell on him, found him, and would have hanged him to a tree. But just as they were doing this, loud singing and the sound of a horse's feet were heard in the distance. On this their hearts were filled with terror, and they pushed their prisoner head first into the sack, hung it on a branch, and took to flight. He, however, worked up there until he had made a hole in the sack through which he could put his head. The man who was coming by was no other than a traveling student, a young fellow who rode on his way through the wood joyously singing his song. When he who was aloft saw that someone was passing below him, he cried, Good day, you have come at a lucky time. The student looked round on every side, but did not know whence the voice came. At last he said, Who calls me? Then an answer came from the top of the tree. Raise your eyes, here I sit aloft in the sack of wisdom. In a short time have I learned great things, compared with this all schools are a jest, in a very short time I shall have learned everything, and shall descend wiser than all other men. I understand the stars, and the signs of the zodiac, and the tracks of the winds, the sand of the sea, the healing of illness, and the virtues of all herbs, birds, and stones. If you were once within it you would feel what noble things issue forth from the sack of knowledge. The student, when he heard all this, was astonished, and said, Blessed be the hour in which I have found thee. May not I also enter the sack for a while? He who was above replied as if unwillingly, For a short time I will let you get into it, if you reward me and give me good words, but you must wait an hour longer, for one thing remains which I must learn before I do it. When the student had waited a while he became impatient, and begged to be allowed to get in at once. His thirst for knowledge was so very great. So he who was above pretended at last to yield, and said, In order that I may come forth from the house of knowledge you must let it down by the rope, and then you shall enter it. So the student let the sack down, untied it, and set him free, and then cried, Now draw me up at once, and was about to get into the sack. Halt! said the other, that won't do, and took him by the head and put him upside down into the sack, fastened it, and drew the disciple of wisdom up the tree by the rope. Then he swung him in the air and said, how goes it with thee, my dear fellow? Behold, already thou feelest wisdom coming, and art gaining valuable experience. Keep perfectly quiet until thou becomest wiser. 
Thereupon he mounted the student's horse and rode away, but in an hour's time sent someone to let the student out again. The farmer's diligence in cultivating the turnip brings about unforeseen rewards. The immense size of the turnip symbolizes the unexpected benefits that can result from hard work and perseverance. The rich brother's envy and greed lead him to seek a similar fortune. However, his approach is driven by material possessions rather than hard work, and it ultimately leads to negative consequences. The rich brothers attempt to deceive the poor brother and the student results in his own downfall. Deception and ill intent are depicted as self-destructive forces. The story uses irony and satire to mock the rich brother's misguided attempts to replicate his sibling's success. It satirizes the pursuit of wealth without considering the means and values associated with it. In summary, the tale conveys messages about the consequences of envy and greed, the value of humility and hard work, the irony of deceptive action, and the true nature of wisdom gained through life experiences. The Fourth Fairy Tale The Duration of Life When God had created the world and was about to fix the length of each creature's life, the ass came and asked, Lord, how long shall I live? Thirty years, replied God. Does that content thee? Oh, Lord, answered the ass. That is a long time. Think of my painful existence. To carry heavy burdens from morning to night, to drag sacks of corn to the mill, that others may eat bread, to be cheered and refreshed with nothing but blows and kicks, Relieve me of a portion of this long time. Then God had pity on him and relieved him of 18 years. The ass went away comforted, and the dog appeared. How long wouldst thou like to live? Said God to him. Thirty years are too many for the ass, but thou wilt be satisfied with that. Lord, answered the dog. Is that thy will? Consider how I shall have to run. My feet will never hold out so long. And when I have once lost my voice for barking and my teeth for biting, what will be left for me to do but run from one corner to another and growl? God saw that he was right and released him from twelve years of life. Then came the monkey. Thou wilt certainly live thirty years willingly, said the Lord to him. Thou hast no need to work as the ass and the dog have to do and wilt always enjoy thyself. Ah. Lord, he answered. It may seem as if that were the case, but it is quite different. When it rains porridge, I have no spoon. I am always to play merry pranks and make faces which force people to laugh. And if they give me an apple and I bite into it, why it is sour? How often sadness hides itself behind mirth. I shall never be able to hold out for 30 years. God was gracious and took off 10. At last man appeared, joyous, healthy and vigorous, and begged God to appoint his time for him. Thirty years shalt thou live, said the Lord. Is that enough for that? What a short time, cried man. When I have built my house and my fire burns on my own heart, when I have planted trees which blossom and bear fruit, and am just intending to enjoy my life, I am to die. O oh Lord, lengthen my time. I will add to it the ass's eighteen years, said God. That is not enough, replied the man. Thou shalt also have the dog's twelve years. Still too little. Well then, said God. I will give thee the monkey's ten years also, but more thou shalt not have. The man went away, but was not satisfied. So man lived seventy years. The first thirty are his human years, which are soon gone. Then is he healthy, merry, works with pleasure, and is glad of his life. Then follow the S's 18 years, when one burden after another is laid on him. He has to carry the corn which feeds others, and blows and kicks are the reward of his faithful services. Then come the dog's 12 years, when he lies in the corner, and growls and has no longer any teeth to bite with. And when this time is over the monkey's 10 years form the end. Then man is weak, headed and foolish, does silly things, and becomes the jest of the children. The story illustrates that life is not always easy and comfortable. Each creature is given a specific time, and during that time, they must face challenges and difficulties. Different animals have different views on time. 
While the donkey endures the hardships of heavy labor, the dog faces the loss of strength and barking ability, and the monkey has to endure meaningless pranks. Each individual's perception of time varies based on their circumstances and state. Aspirations and dissatisfaction are depicted in the character of the man. Even after receiving additional years of life, he remains dissatisfied, showcasing the insatiable nature of human desires. Despite building a house and planting trees, he is still not content. The man symbolizes the greed and lack of contentment inherent in humans. Even after receiving additional years equivalent to the combined time of the donkey, dog, and monkey, he is still dissatisfied. This reflects the negative aspects of human nature. In summary, the story provides insights into the transience and value of time, as well as the challenges and emotions that each creature faces in the journey of life. It also addresses the limitations and discontentment of humans who often seek more than what is allotted to them. The fifth fairy tale, Going a-Traveling. There was once a poor woman who had a son, who much wished to travel, but his mother said, How canst thou travel? We have no money at all for thee to take away with thee. Then said the son, I will manage very well for myself. I will always say, not much, not much, not much. So he walked for a long time and always said, not much, not much, not much. Then he passed by a company of fishermen and said, God speed you. Not much, not much, not much. What sister, Chiro? Not much. And when the net was drawn out, they had not caught much fish. So one of them fell on the youth with a stick and said, Hast thou never seen me threshing? What am I to say, then? Asked the youth, Thou must say, Get it for, get it for. After this he again walked a long time, and said, Get it full, get it full, until he came to the gallows, where they had got a poor sinner whom they were about to hang. Then said he, Good morning, get it full, get it full. What sayst thou, knave, get it full? Dost thou want to make out that there are still more wicked people in the world is not this enough? And he again got some blows on his back. What am I to say, then? Said he, Thou must say, may God have pity on the poor soul. Again the youth walked on for a long while and said, May God have pity on the poor soul. Then he came to a pit by which stood a knacker who was cutting up a horse. The youth said, Good morning, God have pity on the poor soul. What dost thou say, thou ill tempered knave? And the knacker gave him such a box on the ear that he could not see out of his eye. What am I to say, then? Thou must say, there lies the carrion in the pit. So he walked on and always said, There lies the carrion in the pit. There lies the carrion in the pit. And he came to a cart full of people, so he said, Good morning. There lies the carrion in the pit. Then the cart pushed him into a hole, and the driver took his whip and cracked it upon the youth till he was forced to crawl back to his mother. And as long as he lived, he never went out of traveling again. The youth in the story faces negative consequences due to his thoughtless choice of words. His casual expressions lead to misunderstanding and, in some cases, physical harm. This highlights the importance of being mindful of what one says. The reactions of the fishermen, the authorities at the gallows, and the knacker illustrate how negative or inappropriate words can provoke anger and hostility. It emphasizes the idea that words have power and can influence the way others perceive and respond to us. The story underscores the significance of choosing words carefully to avoid misunderstandings and conflicts. Thoughtful and considerate speech is essential for positive interaction and avoiding unnecessary trouble. The youth's final experience serves as a culmination of his thoughtless words, resulting in physical harm and humiliation. The ending reinforces the moral lesson that words can have lasting consequences and that one should be cautious and respectful in communication. In summary, the story uses the misadventures of the youth to highlight the importance of mindful and considerate speech, emphasizing the impact of words on oneself and others. It encourages readers to think before they speak and to choose expressions that promote positive interactions. Do you like the fairy tales I tell you today? They are really meaningful, aren't they? See you tomorrow to listen to beautiful fairy tales together. Bye-bye.